Do you want me to start with the clicker? Well, you have enough. Well, the, so yeah, I mean, uh, when you enter, you introduce yourself, and then when I introduce myself, then I'll. I want to ask. You introduce us to start. Good afternoon. We're going to get started on this next session. Um, I'd like to introduce to you um, Rob Caffey and Angela Chansey from Kansas State University, and they're going to talk about reducing cybersecurity risks with multi-factor authentication, pilot testing dual at K-State. All right. Thank you. Well, this is uh, the stuff we're going to talk about today. Hopefully run through some uh, things that will be of interest to you on this topic. And then I hope we're going to have leave time for some questions uh, as well. Um, introductions. I'm Rob Caffey. Currently today, my role is in the uh, special assistant to the CIO. And uh, in that capacity, I've uh, been involved in this duo project to, to pilot test at K-State. Angela Chauncey is here as well. I'm Angela Chauncey from the office of CIO as project manager for the Duo Pilot. I'd like to um, maybe have a quick introduction from the crowd to see what roles are here today. So um, maybe if you could just show of hands. So um, project managers, um, system on. administrators, identity management, software development, um, help desk, um, any other rules I missed? Infosec. Security. Yeah. Awesome. Some of these so people raise their hand about for everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I can relate to that. Okay, so two-factor authentication, we want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why uh, we need this. Uh, what, it, what really is two-factor authentication? I'm assuming most of you are familiar with that, but basically, uh, when people get into our systems, we want to have uh, not only password, but have another way that people can identify who they are. Uh, a great example is, uh, you know, your uh, ATM card, you have to have the physical card, you have to have a pin to in order to get in, and you have to have both of those things. Uh, we want to, the, at the end of the day, the whole reason for doing two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, is for risk mitigation. We want to reduce the likelihood that something bad will occur if someone's account gets compromised. So we want to, uh, you know, the, the, th the possibility of the threats, uh, the vulnerability that we have to those threats, and the kind of damage, the impact, all sort of come together to impact the risk that we have. Uh, why did we use Duo? So we looked at do a bunch of different options for two-factor authentication at K-State. We have an identity management working group that comprises people from a bunch of different areas, both central and non-central IT, that provide input to us on identity and access management issues. And they recommended that we move forward af after an evaluation process to uh, do a pilot test to do it. So we did for about a year using it with our uh, security group and, and access for uh, VPN access. Um, we also talked to a lot of other partners. Uh, Duo was really popular in the higher ed space. Um, it was very easy for us to deploy with our infrastructure uh, the way it is because we could plop it down sort of right in front of our CAS solution and get everything that was behind it. Uh, we got special pricing through NetPlus and um, 
they really have a platform that we can grow into. In addition to the, the two-factor authentication, they also have uh, the Duo Access and Duo Beyond that we'll talk a little bit more about later uh, that have uh, different levels of control. So the different kinds of uh, authentication factors that people can use, um, mobile phone is the most popular. We do have some people on our campus who have complained that they don't want to use their personal phone to get into, uh, you know, can't, don't want to be compelled to use their personal phone to get into campus resources. Um, but certainly any kind of mobile device will work. Uh, you can use a landline phone, it'll call you and you can say push any key to continue, it'll let you in. Um, I, we have hardware tokens that you can uh, use. I've got one on my key ring here that's a little key fob that generates a code that you can use to log in as your second factor. Or um, there are also UB keys and some, some things like that. So there's hardware methods as well as uh, several different ways that people can log in. And the whole time I've worked in higher ed IT, I don't remember Educause ever having the same issue as number one three years in a row, but InfoSec is there. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's a critical thing for all of our campuses. I'm, I'm sure uh, you're all keenly aware of that. But the uh, access control uh, and uh, securing individuals' accounts is kind of the tip of the spear for us in InfoSec right now. We can't control our environment unless we know who's on it and who's doing what. The risks continue to grow. Uh, data breaches could really cost a lot of money, and we'll look at that. And reputational damage beyond what it would actually cost us to mitigate the problem could be really devastating. So we had uh, an incident, actually two different incidents over the course of the last um, a couple of years where we had uh, direct deposit frauds where people were able to get in uh, to our systems with a phishing scam, uh, breach someone's account, get in and redirect their pa their paycheck to another account. We actually had people lose paychecks over this and the university had to step in and, and manage that. As a, re as a result of that, um, we actually took our direct deposit offline and the only way you could manage direct deposit was, was to go in and fill out a paper form. And so that created an awful lot of work on the part of our HCS staff. So yet another uh, impetus or reason for us to want to do two-factor authentication. Um, we're trying to pr protect our operations. We've got ongoing research. Um, I guess uh, we've spent a lot of time today protecting uh, operations issues. Um, in case you don't know, we had a, there was a fire on the Manhattan campus uh, last night and uh, our data center is uh, swimming in water and smoke right now, and we're uh, I spent most of the day trying to get that. So I'm, I'm keenly familiar with uh, protecting operations issue. Um, and then personal information uh, on, in accounts, it, um, in addition to the, the um, requirements that we have, uh, the compliance issues that we have out there, it's just there's a, a increased expectation level uh, that we will protect the data that's in these personal systems. Um, the cost of a breach uh, could be astounding, right? So this is a, a recent survey, I think it was done by IBM, where they calculated uh, at about just under $250 per record as the sort of the median cost to an institution in the event of a breach. So you start multiplying that by, this, by the, what we have out in the system and it gets really expensive. I also found an infographic that I thought was interesting that talked about the different kinds of data that are available that you can, you know, you sell on the dark web and uh, what it's, uh, you know, roughly worth to people. So if we, you know, we've got 165,000 student records, 95,000 employee records at a median average cost of about $21, somebody could make three or 4 million bucks by selling that data, but it would cost us, you know, even more than that to deal with the problem. So when we talk about risk, we talk about mitigating risk and why do fact, two-factor authentication, this is what I mean by risk, okay? This, so that's the, the purpose of that part of the discussion. Um, we have a little, just a little bit, since some of you people uh, in the room are technical, I thought I would talk just a little bit about the technical architecture at Kansas State and our IDM infrastructure. Um, we do have uh, a set of identity sources, uh, our authoritative systems, our student system, HRI, HR system, uh, different places that have authoritative information about people. 
we aggregate that into a person database. So our, our core identity management infrastructure is we have a, data, a person database that's all the information about people. We have a keys system, which is uh, assertions and access control information. And um, then we've got this all tied together uh, with integration services, APIs, and we use Grouper from Internet2 as an open source uh, for making grouping assertions. And then all of that is available um, to the outside world to authenticate using CAS and Shibboleth. And so we set Duo right down in front of CAS, and all of the applications that are setting behind it are able to, we're able to leverage CAS then to, to do um, two-factor authentication for all those services. We can also set up Duo for other services, and we're doing that now uh, with some of our special users on campus that have uh, departments that have their own applications and that sort of thing. All right. This is Great. yours. Thank you. So next I'm gonna talk about our pilot implementation. So I wanted um, everyone to know the project team um, had six core team members, so not a large team, just, just six, and then two engineers from HR did some part-time work for the direct deposit. Duo provides a liftoff guide on their website and they provide a lot of documentation to help um, the team, including help documentation and project management um, information. So we followed the deployment timeline off the liftoff guide and it really helped us with our implementation. We implemented three groups in our pilot and um, used about 300 licenses. So our first group was um, IT employees with elevated access. And we did that training face-to-face. -face. So um, that's how we, we started the first group. The second group we built on that and did even more high security access for our biosecurity research. And they have um, special applications as well that we set up. And then we had the help desk perform the training and we included more surveys to gather more feedback. Our third group was um, HR employees and then faculty. And the HR employees had elevated system access as well. So they could get more familiar with the product when we would later add um, direct deposit for the pilot group. And then we also added more documentation for the Duo administrator. So our full pilot was from January till April. Um, so that last month we worked on writing a report. We, during that time, we also consulted our aspirational universities for ideas on our rollout and um, one, one thing we did learn from one university is that during online exams um, on Canvas, the university's Canvas, um, some departments had um, the students check in their phone at the door. So then they would come and take their online assignment and not be able to have their phone to authenticate into Duo. So, um, so that was a good lesson learned um, to provide these bypass codes. So um, we really appreciated the university consultation. Also, we had our usability team um, take a, a short study of Duo and really helped test on multiple platforms, browsers, and um, really found the system to be very accessible um, and also generated a report. Some of those items in the report we um, submitted to Duo. Um, for example, maybe they ordered something, um, you know, call me, text me, um, and another option, and then on another screen, they would reorder it. So we recommended for usability to or always order them in the same order. So um, we provided that back to the vendor. People and get grumpy if they go to click on the place they always click and it's a different option. So their phone's ringing instead of their cell phone. Yeah, so we had, had a good um, report with that. And then also the Duo, Duo recommends for business continuity planning um, to have a plan for if Duo was down on whether it's failed opened or failed closed, which means does Duo still run um, and they can't get in? Um, or can they go back, pass through? 
So um, when we talked to our aspirational universities, they hadn't ever experienced Duo being down, but just have a plan for that. So um, during, during this outage we're having right now, Duo is up and we have some many things down. So, <laughs> so Duo, but Duo's up, so. <laughs> Um, we provided a lot of stakeholder communication, including um, Rob's our executive sponsor, so he was able to attend most of the meetings. Our identity management working group who recommended the solution. We've done presentations for faculty senate on technology and um, other IT, um, keeping them communicated too. So, and then the IT helped us, provided a lot of training for their staff. And then we also kept a change log based on these, all these surveys we were sending, the pilot group. Um, so we kept a change log of the changes we would make now and the changes we would make after go live. We released this direct deposit self-service feature to the 300 people in our pilot, so they're able to change their direct deposit and um, only them. And they have to authenticate with the Duo before they can do that. We opened a self-enrollment portal, so we um, looked at how our users enroll in Duo and um, improve that process. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the, the challenges and successes. And then, as mentioned, we produced a final report. So the final report um, has our unresolved issues um, that need to be addressed for go live for the campus. Um, we produced three cost scenarios, and I'll show you one of them. And then we our recommendations. So as mentioned, we developed a um, self enrollment portal. Out of the box, Duo provides enrollment. Um, you, you add them to to Duo and um, they are instructed to enroll. And when we add them to that group, they need to enroll then. So we did send them emails preparing them that they're gonna have to enroll on, in Duo on the certain day. Um, but if they miss those emails or those emails went into spam, um, they immediately had to enroll in Duo and maybe they were on the phone talking with the customer and um, so that we got some feedback in the feedback surveys that that was disruptive, like they would like to enroll when it's convenient and when they have time. So we implemented that new enrollment strategy using the Duo API. So Duo provides a way to do this. However, when you can enroll at your convenience, we, there was also challenges with that um, because um, the, that next group, many of them did not enroll. So we they never found a convenient time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, for the campus go live, it, if we use this method, it will require more communications and marketing. We anticipate with the campus go live, we'll use both methods. We'll have some who are more um, um, open enrollment and some that will enroll quicker. And then as I mentioned, we opened direct deposit for the pilot group. So these manual changes that HR makes um, for the paper forms will eventually improve when we roll this out to all employees. So they won't have to do the manual process. And I get to talk about a little bit about using Duo. So um, one of the ancillary benefits to using Duo is it's got some killer uh, uh, statistics and, 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 and graphics and analytics and stuff that show you what's going on. And since you're a bunch of tech people largely, I figured we'd actually show you some of that stuff. So uh, the, uh, the standard dashboard that you come to when you, when you open up Duo, uh, the admin side will tell you how many users you have and how many devices they have out there. And it'll even tell you how many of those endpoints are up to date in terms of their patch level. And uh, if they, if they've, got all of the boxes checked that you need to in terms of the, the standard security, which is, which is pretty useful. Um, we can go deeper into the device insight and it'll tell me out of the devices I have, 
you know, which one you can click and, and drill down on these and, and see where those devices are. Now, we don't have a formal policy right now to say lock out people with iPhones that are not at the, at the right uh, patch level. We could set up policies like that. Right now, we just have insight into what's going on with those devices that we didn't have before. So that's, that's useful. Um, we can also set up custom policies. Like I mentioned, we can go in and say, you know, for uh, users uh, uh, who are logging into one application, we want to set a, a certain set of rules for uh, access control or requiring uh, two-factor authentication. And you can have some uh, more stringent policies and some more lenient depending on the, the risk associated with the application and the type of users and that sort of thing. So it's pretty... Uh, pretty flexible and that there's a user interface to manage all that kind of stuff. Again, uh, it gives us a lot of insights into the actual devices that are out there, um, the breakdown of iOS and, and Android. I, we used to have really high iOS use at K-State, like much higher than the national average, and it started to balance out in the last couple of years. I don't know if you've seen that on your campuses too, if we're just an outlier for some reason, but that's uh, sort of what's going on. And then each of, the, uh, each of these screens, in addition to the aggregation at the top, has you can actually drill down on the individual accounts. And I can click on that person's account and go to all of that user's information in, uh, in Duo. And I can also, this, these screens are available to our help desk when they're troubleshooting, too. They can tell what's going on with different people's devices. Uh, we can get like a distribution throughout the day of the authentications and when they're going on. So we know uh, sort of what those traffic patterns look like. We can tell when um, authentications were, have failed for some reason, if a user selected that that, that wasn't them or if, if they've timed out. Um, we, can, uh, we can also see, you know, when these access are denied, like on an hour by hour basis and by stratify sort of by applications, by the different applications that are supported. Um, we can actually tell what the purpose of the failure was. So if they've, if they've used um, push, but they didn't, um, they didn't, they just ignored it. They didn't let it go. If they actually click deny when they try to log in, um, then we can alert someone in the infosec team or the help desk who can go follow up with that, try to find out if there's a, a real problem going on. Um, so all that's pretty useful. And then the um, there's just a lot of uh, useful data for us in terms of supporting the system, including this one that actually shows us of all the licenses that we've purchased, we can see a certain number have successfully authenticated, a certain number are still working on it, need to go out there and get lean on these people to enroll, and then these are that's our cushion that we have where we have licenses that we can use. So it really helps us sort of know where we are. And your outcomes, right? So Rob showed, Rob showed the administrator um, interface, but I just wanted to mention how easy to use the user interfaces for push notifications. So I have elevated access to some of our systems like Office 365. So when I log into Office 365, I just get this simple push notification on my mobile phone and just press it and click accept. So really um, feel more secure having this second step knowing um, that Duo is there. So, the, and it's a really simple interface, but you also have those alternative methods that Rob mentioned, like tokens. So, our final report, as I mentioned, it included cost scenarios and our, um, all of our research and our pilot breakdown. And the final report went to um, leadership and administration. Also, that it included um, some plans for campus communications when we go live with the campus. Um, for example, we'd like to do giveaways since um, we did um, not have some enroll with the self-enrollment, so we could do encouragement through maybe giveaways and educate the community on the importance of the security. And then this slide is a cost scenario if all employees at K-State had um, Duo. It's about 12,600 users, I think, is what, what this is estimated at. It turns out K-State has more student employees than we have regular employees. I didn't know that until we started doing this project. So we have two other cost scenarios that is a slower rollout 
um, to campus. So this is with um, rolling it out to everyone. These are, these are the rate card prices, by the way. Um, if you go to the website, this is what they say they charge for using Duo. Um, all universities are eligible for EDU pricing that's uh, much more favorable if you have a site license. But you have to be up in at least, what, 2,500, sort of the, the cutoff for 5,000 users before you get to that um, level, I think. So these, these are monthly costs and the rate card pricing that they give. Uh, this, is, this is a yearly cost up here based on site licensing for the university. If you're an Internet 2 member, they have a net plus pricing through Internet 2. Um, they also have a state of Kansas contract. You can buy it through SHI, I think. So what are our next steps? We want to finalize the enrollment strategy between um, the more aggressive enrollment versus the uh, more convenient enrollment and who's in which situation. We want to work on the unresolved issues list, um, continue to work with the help desk to make sure they're ready. We do need to add some policies and then a marketing campaign. Um, and it, also, we need to identify which cost scenario we're, we're going to select. So that decision yet needs to be made. We covered the material we want to. I hope there's some good questions and we can continue the discussion. Yes. I'm just curious, have you I know you're still rolling it out, so you maybe have not encountered this, this yet, but I'm wondering, have you had any instances where the duo authentication has been defeated? Where uh, I guess what I could foresee is somebody gets a notice on their the push notification mm -hmm. and they just automatically hit accept or go yeah. ahead. Have you had any instances like that? So we haven't. A um, uh, couple things. Uh, we're not using the SMS as an option because SMS is very easily defeated and newness standards recommend that you don't support SMS uh, text messages for for two-factor authentication so we're not we just started off not doing that the other thing is is we don't really pick up more users by adding text um, if you have a cell phone and you can then it's either a smartphone and you can use the app or it's just a regular old phone and you can get a phone call to it um, so using a text message doesn't pick up a lot of new users for us. It doesn't add people that couldn't have other methods and it does introduce some security risks. So we're not doing that. We have had significant discussion about uh, what if we have uh, users who accounts are already compromised. We send them the email that says, hey, you got to enroll in Duo and the bad actor gets in there and enrolls in Duo for them before we get a chance to do it. Um, and there are a number of different ways that different universities have dealt with that, that we've talked to. One way is, is we could force a password change and then, and then uh, do it at that time. That still, you know, that doesn't immediately eliminate that possibility, but it does make it less likely. One of the scenarios that we talked about would be to open this up for opt-in for all of our employees on campus or all of our full-time faculty, and then say, Okay, this particular cohort is going to be uh, is is going to on password change period when they'd normally be forced to change their password. We'll do the fa the password change and then t 48 hours later do the duo enrollment. So there's a number of different ways that we talked about it, but the, your specific scenario where somebody just doesn't pay attention to it has not has not come up. Uh, I suppose it could. If I was in a meeting and, so, and it, I got a thing that said I'm supposed to, you know, authorize somebody in Duo and I wasn't trying to do it, I think I'd, I'd notice it right away. But. And I think most of us would if they just Yeah. 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 So. Long term, do you have any plans to try to do this for students? Yeah. You want to talk about that or? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, could you not hear me? Short, short answer, yes. Do we have plans to implement this for students in the long term? I think that, uh, uh, well, certainly my, my position 
as a IT manager and administrator is, is that we should make this available to everybody. Uh, all of the accounts that we have have some level of access. Even if it's just a student, they have a access to student uh, academic information, uh, things that we have a responsibility to keep private under FERPA. And uh, we, you know, there's, there's just no reason we shouldn't do this. Even to use, you know, iTunes, uh, uh, you have to have two-factor authentication nowadays if uh, people do it with their banking systems. People are used to it. Uh, for us, it's, it's really a cost issue, a total cost in terms of the licensing to buy the licenses for people, but also an issue uh, in supporting and, and, and getting it out to all those users. Um, you know, you can see that we were talking about 70, 80,000 bucks to do all of our employees, which includes you know, a bunch of student employees, but to add all the rest of those students, and we're talking about, you know, getting up over $100,000, and I don't know about your school, budgets are kind of tight at K-State uh, right about now, so uh, so we're not, not deploying it as fast as we'd like to, but we're hoping that we'll eventually get there. Have you, I see you've done this with Cash and SHIB, has there been a push to do this on privileged access workstations or any other kind of workstation model? So yes, we have tested this with some other applications. We've got our um, the BRI facility in Manhattan, uh, the uh, Biological Research Institute. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, Biosecurity Research Institute. There we go. Sorry, um, they uh, uh, have a bunch of uh, fifty some users that have uh, access to some pretty sensitive stuff. And so they've tested using Duo on their workstations um, and uh, RDP. RDP, for example. That's okay. They have that set up. Yeah. So some non-CAS services, BRI. The, the CAS for us was basically the convenience of being able to deploy Duo once and get everything that's already behind CAS and most of our users in those, in those systems. But there are a bunch of other places where we're going to want to leverage it once we have it in place. Yeah. So for your uh, marketing and communications, like how did you guys do that? Was it just a whole lot of emails that you sent out or were there other things that you did besides that? Correct. For this pilot, it was definitely emails and the first group was face-to-face -face, um, training and um, talking with them and then emails for the rest of the pilot group. So Definitely campus-wide, we need a marketing campaign and um, incentives and et cetera. Thank you. So the interesting thing that we did with this was, because we did it behind CAS this way, uh, in order to get just a certain number of users to use it, we had to uh, set up a configuration on our CAS. As soon as you log in, it looks to see if you're in the group that we have asked to do Duo. And if it is, then it pushes you to Duo, so we have to do two things. We have to enroll the user in Duo and enroll their device, their phone or their token or whatever, but then we also have to add them to the group that tells them, tells CAS to defer to Duo and, and require that user to use it. So there's a chicken and egg problem, right? When you're getting people to enroll, you don't wanna ever put them in the, the group that's gonna require them to use it before they have successfully enrolled because then they'll, be doing something important in a meeting and they'll get asked to enroll in Duo and they'll be very unhappy about it. I can, can, can attest to the fact that they don't like that. Uh, uh, alternatively, you can get a situation where somebody enrolls in Duo but they don't get added to the group. So they said, hey, I enrolled in Duo but no, it's never asked me to use it, so, so what gives? So we've had both of those uh, scenarios pop up. So we, what we've done now is we've hopefully gotten to something where we they get an we put them into the group. They get an automated email from the system that asks them to politely go use this. Hopefully that'll be backed up with this other communication and training that we're doing. We're talking about leveraging sort of boots on the ground people in the buildings. Uh, when we rolled out Canvas a couple years ago, we had these uh, coaches, K-State Online coaches, and, and we had one in every building who would be the person who you could go to, a sort of a local expert who could answer questions for you. So we're talking about leveraging that model and, and getting out, and, and hopefully we reach a critical mass where the faculty will talk to each other. They go, hey, you know, I did this. It's really no big deal. You can, you can do it in five minutes, that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, when we set it up to so where 
the users would get the email, go to the web page, they could read about it, they could watch a video about it, and when they were ready, they would click a button that would simultaneously put them into the group that would require them to use it and dump them into the screen where they can enroll. So if they got to the point where, where they weren't enrolled but they were required to use it, at least they'd know why because they clicked the button and said, yes, I'm ready to go start using Duo. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yep. How are you handling the, the forgotten cell phone and the I just got a new phone and now I can't work today complaints? Well. Yeah, that's a good one. We did run into that. So we really encourage enrolling two of devices. So make sure that you um, also enroll. Maybe two or your, more. Yeah. Two or more. Make sure you also enroll your office phone another, another way because we've even had project team staff left their phone at home and had to drive back home to get their, their phone. So they definitely then added a second device. Yeah, so multiple devices. It, you, you pay for the number of user accounts you have in Duo, but everybody can have one device or five devices or you know, N devices, and it doesn't cost any more to add more. So we encourage people to, to use every, every phone they have access to, you can add it and that, that way it becomes a, a way for you to do it. You can also share, you know, if you've got two people in the same office, they can share a cell phone and, and both, uh, it, both accounts will, will bring that number for a second factor. Um, also the help desk, we get quite a few calls to the help desk where they can just turn, they can just uh, give them a bypass code, a one-time bypass code, or they can do it for a period of time. We've had a lot of questions about faculty traveling overseas and what were they gonna do? Uh, the tokens, uh, the hardware tokens that we have, the key fobs don't require any kind of connectivity. This just c generates a code. I guess the same algorithm that runs on this chip in here runs on the server. And so they can, uh, they can use this if they're offline. There's a second factor. You mentioned during the presentation, um, fail open versus fail closed. And have you guys thought any more about that? Or have you thought, hey, these apps were going to fail up and these apps were going to fail close? Um, or these users were going to fail up and these users were going to fail close? We've had a surprising amount of conversation about this topic. Uh, <laughs> so our, there's some strongly minded people in our InfoSec team that, that really think we should always default to fail closed. You know, my thought is, um, <coughs> from a usability standpoint, uh, in the very, very unlikely event that Duo's down, we've already said it's, it's not down, our whole data center's down, Duo's up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the very unlikely event that Duo goes down for a short period of time, do you want the application to revert back to the same level of security we've had for the last 20 years, or do you want it to crash and burn? <laughs> To me, it's a pretty easy answer, right? You, you just default back to a somewhat level, lower level security. But where we've landed on this issue from the different points of view is that the default decision is, is a moot point because what we're gonna do is every time we add an application, we're gonna make the application owner decide. So we don't have really, whatever our default is, it doesn't matter, there is no default. You can't get an application added unless you decide and sort of sign off on what you wanna do in that. Whoever the responsible, party is for that given application. If it's a central thing, it would be the CIO. If it's a, if it's a departmental application, it would be the uh, departmental IT people or the dean or whatever would, would assume the risk for, for what they want to do in that way. But yeah, we've had an awful lot of discussion about fail open, fail close, much more than I ever thought we would. We are much earlier in the process than you are. We've only got about 25 users, but I realized early on when I put the RDP client on my surface, if I have it fail closed and I have no network, I can't get into my surface. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's a good example of the reason why it seems to me that um, I, I'm a, I'm a big believer and you never want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Right. And, and if we can do something to improve the security posture of our systems at the university, we can improve the uh, you know, security of accounts, we can reduce the risk of, of damage from uh, accounts getting compromised, then we should do that. And if sometimes there's an unlikely scenario where it doesn't quite work where we want to, that's okay, right? We're, we're still making an improvement. 
different people feel differently about it. We ended up solving the resolving it just by saying, hey, we're just always going to let the person who owns the app decide. And that's, that's how we make it work. What else? Um, I may have missed the answer to this question earlier in regards to it. It is a, you have it installed locally, correct? Or is it software as a service? Sorry. So do is software as a service. Software as a service. Okay. So yeah. my then resulting question becomes moot because I was going to ask if it's local, is it load balanced? So no need for that answer. I'm now. quite sure it's well load balanced. It's, it seems to be uh, running quite well uh, out there in the cloud. As a matter of fact, the only thing we're having problems with today are this, is the stuff that's running in our own or not running in our own data center <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, we got 99 problems, but Duo's not one today. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about the process? Yeah. No? Well, if you see us uh, later throughout the event, we'd, we'd be happy to tell you the real story, you know, behind the scenes if you want, or if you catch us tonight at the, uh, at the event. Otherwise, I thank you for, uh, for listening. And if you, if you do multi-factor authentication on your own campus, best of luck to you. Okay. <laughs>